Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the 6570. I have already given you some details on Dr. Raker, and I am just so excited to have her on today. And so welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And I, I love speaking with, you know, as, as a mom, I have four kids. I love speaking with doctors and pediatricians to get some insight as to what trends you're seeing, um, what your kind of medicine is. And I'm going to get to your story in a second, because you practice medicine in a very unique way that I think there is definitely a trend going toward. And we even had an incident not too long ago that I'll share with you, um, a little bit later that we needed something like that. And so, um, I just want to start off with just having you share your story. How did you get to where you are today? You are a pediatrician, but you also do telemedicine and you're also a parenting coach. And I want to to just hear how did all of those pieces come into play in order to get to you to where you are right now? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so I've been practicing for almost 20 years. And in that time, my husband's also a physician and we met and he was starting his training. So his training was a bit longer than mine. And I ended up just kind of following him through his journey which meant that I had moved around a bit and did a lot of different um, jobs. So I have worked in the hospital, I've worked in urgent care, emergency room, um, outpatient, inpatient, different types of outpatient settings. And last, my last stint was working um, for home health care. So I really got to get a breath of, you know, the different types of care and how we provide care and what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it. And what I really felt like was missing was um, a connection between the pediatrician families. And now not to say that pediatricians aren't doing an excellent job because they really are, but for some parents, I felt like there was just something missing in those office visits. You know, they're, they're just getting shorter and shorter and, um, it's just hard to cover everything. And it's hard for the pediatricians too, from, from professionally, from our side, we want to answer all the questions, but we know we, you know, there's three other patients waiting and it's just, you got to keep that flow going. And so it, it was just getting really hard to, for me personally, to connect the way I wanted and to answer all those questions. So that's how the telemedicine came about was you, you know, you're in the comfort of your own home, um, you can schedule it, you can find more time, right? I'm going to have more hours in the day. I was able to go later at night than traditional office could, um, available on weekends. So just more available and more time to really answer all your questions. And the parent coaching piece really came up during COVID when I just realized i not just the telemedicine answering urgent questions, but I love counseling. I love coaching. And that was the other piece that was missing in the office. There just wasn't enough time for that. So I decided to go official and um, get certification. And it's been great. It's actually helped me a lot with my own kids that not that I wasn't expecting it to help with my own kids, but I didn't think I needed it as much as I did with my own kids. And I was like, huh, yeah, that was, that was good. So I got to go through it as you know, a client, and then I certified as a coach. So it was an all encompassing program. And I just wanted to be there. I wanted to be there for families, be there for moms. Um, It can just be really lonely, you know, and you just think you're doing it wrong all the time. And I just want to come and say, you're not, you're really not. There's a lot of different ways to do it. And, you know, sometimes you just need a little support and guidance, but for the most part, like you are what your child needs. Absolutely. And I often talk about that with all of, you know, my coaching clients and and, uh, my community and talking about how every family is unique. Every child is unique. And so, you know, I try to stay away from the shoulds as much as possible, because when you start going down that road, 
And I was definitely there uh, when I first had my kids. We went through uh, two, two and a half years of infertility, and then we had four kids in four years. And so oh, wow. we were, you know, one end, <laughs> one end of the, you know, spectrum to the other. And when I was going into those pediatricians, we were living in a big city at the time. Now we live in a small town, um, but we were living in a big city uh, whenever we had our kids from Chicago to Indianapolis. And every time I went in there, it was a very rushed process. It was very stressful. Right. It was, you know, don't touch anything. And it was in and out and in and out and what is going on. And I actually remember, um, so one of my children has vitiligo. Mm -hmm. And, um, for those that are listening that don't know, it's, uh, an autoimmune, uh, skin condition, and she just doesn't have pigment on part of her skin. She's a very fair hair or fair skinned blonde. So you don't really notice it at all during the winter, but in the summer when, you know, she has some, mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, my point is that I went into my pediatrician at her one year visit and their birthdays in our, are in October. So we had been through the summer and I was like, there's just seems to be like this area that seems lighter than the rest. And our pediatrician in haste and nothing, you know, nothing more. I loved our pediatrician, but there was just so much haste there. And I do feel like, and, uh, uh, he said, oh, it was just a, um, a sunscreen mishap, you know, that was all it was and mm. don't worry about it. And I was like, okay, year two comes around and I come back in. So again, October. And I was like, so this is still here. And he's like, oh yeah, it was just a sunscreen mishap. And I was like, mm -hmm. I did not put like, got <laughs> uh, the same huge, exact spot, <laughs> right. A huge gob <laughs> for some reason on this exact same spot on my child's you know face and forehead for two years in a row, you know, right. but I think that that can be a product sometimes of so like, okay, it's not life thre threatening. We're good, right. you know, get in and out. And so, um, anyway, that just came to mind when you were talking and I think taking that time to do telemedicine is so important. And we had an incident I, I told you about, um, uh, and the, uh, when we were first talking and our daughter, uh, it was after, I think it was her second, uh, COVID booster, but anyway, she collapsed and she was sitting there. She was, uh, playing a game of monopoly. And all of a sudden she's uh, 14 and she just went down and yeah. then she had complete vertigo for about 24 hours and she couldn't hold anything down. And she just Ugh. felt like the room was spinning and it turned out to be just one of those weird side effects that can happen. Right. That doesn't right. happen to many, right. but of course it happens to her. And, um, but my point is it was a Friday night, right? I couldn't, mm -hmm. you know, get to the pediatrician and a friend of mine, um, who is a, a PA, a, a physician's assistant, I was able to call and they, you know, coach me through some things and what to do. And we ended up just mm -hmm. giving her a bunch of Dramamine, uh, mm -hmm. for the, for the time being. And it stopped after about 24 hours, but having that, you know, person in my pocket and person mm -hmm. I could, uh, reach out to like what you're doing it changed everything. And it gave me so much peace. And I knew I was like, okay, all right. I know what's going on. Somebody is in, in my corner. Somebody is also right. monitoring this besides me. And so I, I figure you probably go through a lot of things like that of. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And, and that was the other thing that prompted it. You know, it was like, well, my friends can call me, but what if you don't have a friend, you know, and I was getting yeah. a lot of those phone calls, especially on the weekends. And my goal was really to try to keep them out of the ER or urgent care and, right. you know, see if I can get them through the weekend until they can go see their pediatrician. So that alone, I think is worth a lot, especially now who wants to really be there. Um, so yeah, and, and a lot of things really can wait, you know, I mean, honestly, sometimes even broken bones, if you think they're broken, it's not an emergency. Um, they're not going to do anything that you probably can't kind of do at home. In the meanwhile, um, unless it's an obvious break or something, right? Like we're talking, <laughs> when you're like not sure, <laughs> right? Like, but um, you know, emergencies are emergencies, one hundred percent. But then, then there's that like, I'm not really sure. Do I really need to go? You know, the ear infections. You can give a Motrin. You can kind of make them comfortable and wait till the morning. So there's like things that you can do that you don't have to be seen right away. Um, and then I do think telemedicine. Um, 
will advance more and more to the point that I will be able to look in your ears. You know, there'll be an app on the iPhone and I will be able to listen to the lungs because you'll have an extension. And so I think things are going to advance where we actually can do like a physical on um, through a computer screen. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And so that was going to be my next question to you in the field that you actually work in with your colleagues. Do you see a a convergence or, or a migration toward telemedicine in general? So, I, you know, that the, everyone was doing it, right? We had to do it during COVID and it became a thing. And I think a lot of doctors have adopted it, mm-hmm. but I think most people, especially if you are someone that is in an office setting, prefer to have hands. But I do think telemedicine really is great for like follow-up visits right? Where you're just kind of checking in. Um, It's great for like psychiatric type visits. Um, So there's a lot of ways that it it is perfect for. And right now, I think since it was so much during COVID and and so many people are are really want to get back to the Mm face-to-face, but it's not growing like the same way. But I think in the future, it'll continue to become a bigger chunk of what we do. It's just, it's just progress in technology, right? I mean, you get everything delivered to your door, you get, you know, it's just, people are going to want that flexibility and that ease of um, my baby sleeping in the other room, but I can do this, or, you know, I don't have to leave the house right now. So I do think we're going to see more and more of it in the future. But, um, but I don't think we'll ever lose that office setting either. You know, there's, there's so many, there's only so many things that you can do without being face to face. So I think it'll be more adjunctive. Yeah. I hope, I hope, I don't, I don't want us to ever lose that face to face time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that those yearly visits are crucial and obviously you need vaccines and things like that. So I think even if you have like the yearly visits or the, you know, monthly when you're younger, And then in between as things come up, and like I said, for me, um, parenting and counseling and just that other support that you need, I think that would be amazing to have an online support system. Yeah, I I agree. You you mentioned vaccine and my first thought was some like weird extension of off my phone because we were talking about a stethoscope (laughs) or something. And I was like, oh, that would be quite the extension. Get the vaccine back, you know? (laughs) Who knows? I mean, right. Yeah, you know, we could be the Jetsons in a few years flying that around. That is true. You know. That is true. Um, there is a show that uh, we watch occasionally, and it's it takes place in the future. It's called Upload, and it is on I don't I think it's on Amazon Prime. But mm-hmm. my uh, it takes place so far in the future, and they have these different things. And uh, last night uh, there was this um, this older gentleman that it has been diagnosed with uh, vape lung um, that. Uh, in the future. And so Mm -hmm. basically it sounds very much like emphysema, you know, type of thing Mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. And, um, his daughter asked, when was the last time you were at the doctor? He's like, I just had a Google visit yesterday, you know, and it was, (laughs) yeah, totally. It was, it was pretty funny. So just kind of went along with our uh, conversation, but I want to kind of, uh, take a, take a turn here in our conversation, because I think one of the important things and you have teenagers too and mm-hmm. you know um and i have all uh, teens almost tweens uh, or uh, almost teens i have a 12 year old two 14 year olds and a 16 and i notice and i felt this way too that when i get into later middle and especially high school and also especially as a young woman that going to the pediatrician was like are you serious mom? Right. Mm-hmm. Like, do I have to go to the pediatric? Can I just go to the like doctor, doctor? Right. But then that also had its own, you know, angst, uh, that was stapled to it. So uh, can you walk me through a little bit? When is a good transition? How is uh, a good, uh, how does a parent do a good transition between pediatrician and adult? you know, quote unquote adult yeah. doctors? Um, and I'll, I'll share a funny story about that. So <laughs> I actually went to my pediatrician until I was in med school. <laughs> um, so that's like mid twenties ish. <laughs> and I remember actually doing my pediatric rotation and got so sick. I mean, 
Mm. Pediatricians, we have the best immune systems, but obviously this was my first stint. And, um, and I just got some awful, awful virus. I, mean, I don't think I've ever been this sick in my life. And I went to my pediatrician and I sat there in the office waiting room and people were staring at me like, where is the kid? Like, <laughs> is she, what is she doing here? You know, cause I was just sitting there, no, no child with me. So anyway, that was a very rare situation. I'd known my pediatrician for years. He had a big influence on me, but um, yeah, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't recommend that. And even he was like, okay, it's time for you to move on. Um, and, you no, know, no, I, no I more lollipops depends. for you. Is that what he said? Yeah, exactly. I'm like, he's <laughs> like, I love you, but like, you need to go find someone else. Um, so I think it really depends on your child. You know, I think for a girl, it could be uncomfortable. You know, I, I think having like, you know, we always say like having a female pediatrician or a male for a boy, it doesn't matter so much when they're younger, but maybe when they're doing their physical exams when they're older, if there's an office with different doctors, you can always switch that. Some kids really don't care. And I don't think I would make it like, you know, a point, but just ask them, are you comfortable with this? This is what the exam is going to entail. They, they just, they have to look, right. you know, and if they're not comfortable to have an open discussion about it, I think is really important. I don't think it's good to assume. And, you know, they may grow up and have a male OBGYN or, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's just, it's your own comfort level. And I don't want to make them think it's weird if they don't think it's weird, right? Like, right. it's it's not weird. It's totally fine. But if you would rather have a male, whatever it is, it's like having a female masseuse versus a male masseuse. It's just, it's comfort levels. Um, and then I think that age, as far as aging out, Usually we say around college time because it just seems like a natural um, progression. They're, you know, usually moving out of the house, moving into the dorms. Um, they can find maybe a doctor within the college system or depending on what city they're in or whatever it may be. But you know, sometimes kids come back from college for like checkups or if they're sick, you know, during because technically it's till 21 that mm -hmm. we can see kids. So we still sometimes can see kids when they're a little bit older, especially if it's just like a cold or something, right? Yeah. But part of it also is you start to have adult problems or adult sure. diagnoses, and then it's better to go see um, a family medicine doctor or an internal medicine doctor. So it just depends. Um, and then as far as like transitioning to ob guide you truly don't need to do that or to get a pap smear or any of those things until a few years after being sexually active. Mm. So I know that was like 18, you have to go to ob -Gyne. I think that was back when like we were growing up, that was kind of the thing, but like you really don't need that. You know, you're not gonna see changes on a pap smear after your first sexual interaction and things like that. So again, I would leave it up to your daughters and just say, hey, this is, you know, something you need to do yearly. This is when you need to start. I just think the, the more open conversations you can have about it, the better. Um, you know, and the, the thing that I will say, if, if for some reason it is uncomfortable, if you feel like your daughter can't be open with you, then I would suggest going to maybe ob or someone sooner because maybe they will be able to talk to that person. And ultimately we just want them to be safe. So as a physician, like, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this. We will kick you out for team visits, right. And, and have a conversation with the child. And we tell them that this is confidential, except for certain things, um, because we just want them to be able to tell someone and right. want them to be safe. So I do think that's really important. So for some reason you feel like I'm not sure if my daughter's telling me she may be wanting to be sex active, but I don't know, you know, go ahead and make that OB visit and just say, we're just doing this as routine yep. and let them talk and let your, you know, let your daughter get what she needs to get. I think that's the most important and be safe. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I mean, we practice uh, oh, in my family, but also in my, in my coaching practice, we practice those open conversations constantly. Um, mm -hmm. because 
that's what's needed for everything, not just in Mm -hmm. this, but I do find it interesting and I have yet to run into, and you might um, have a different experience and I hope so, but I have yet to run into a pediatrician's office that I, I did this when I was a kid and I know that my teens now you walk in and everything is so cute right? Yeah, Everything, yeah. you know, you got the little fishies on the wall, you got the little, you know, the cartoons and all of this. And so I, that's definitely part of the hesitation, right? As they're growing up, they're like, I don't need to go into the Elmo room, you know, and, yeah, and yeah. they're 14 or 16 or whatever. And so I think it would be great. Uh, any, anybody out there building pediatrician buildings <laughs> that is listening to have like a teen wing. Teen room. Yeah, yeah. Like, have yeah one or two three whatever rooms that feel uh, you know more mature and I feel like that would really help with the transition process um Mm -hmm. because every pediatrician I know and they have such a beautiful heart and you know they're doing it because it makes the younger ones feel more comfortable and at ease but then it makes the older ones not feel as comfortable and at ease yeah that's an excellent idea you know thinking back to practices that build they're usually starting with babies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like they don't have teens yet. So I think that's part of it is that, you know, most practices that are being built or had been built, um, were just getting referrals for babies because they're just building their practice. So yeah, it's a great idea to kind of grow, like to, to have that build in option. Yeah. Yeah. Just- I ever build a practice. There you go. Yes, please, yeah. please do that. And uh, my kids will be way out of pediatrics ages, but, um, but yeah, yeah but I think it's a great idea. <laughs> just helping I them did. feel, and it gives them the sense of I'm growing up and they can take on more of that responsibility now. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, to your point, uh, when, uh, the doctors, you know, have the parents leave and they're sitting there and talking to them about, you know, very intense issues or some things that they might, you know, even have shame or guilt around, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and then they're surrounded by, you know, Disney characters. They're like, I should be right. There's that should again, I should be not even having this conversation in this environment, but I don't even know what to say. So um, no, that's, that's a really great point. I'm really glad glad you brought that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, anything that we could do in order to help our, help our kids, our, our young men, young women, um, and let's just face it, young women are having more of these, you know, uh, um, changes that are happening. You know, I see, uh, especially young women in, um, middle school, right. They mm-hmm. start to have physical changes before the boys do. And so there's mm-hmm. this sense of I'm growing up, I'm leaving childhood behind, um, mm-hmm. a lot sooner than the boys. And so having that being mirrored in their medical care, which is why I think telemedicine also might be such a great idea in that mm-hmm. regard, um, so that they yeah. feel safe, but, uh, safe and, For sure. and open to talk about those conversations. So, um, in our last point, I want to touch on here because, and I say this kind of selfishly because I have a child that is interested in medicine and yeah. what she talks about. So, uh, and she's 14 right now. So we have a few years, but what do you, how, how would you recommend talking to anyone today, considering the fast change that is happening with medicine? How would you talk to somebody that might be interested in it in the future? Um, is it really just coming back to, you know, if you're called to take care of people in this way, this is, you know, what you do, and then you just adjust to whatever and how it's being done then, or I don't know, what advice would you have for young people that are looking into medicine in the future? I think I would say, look at all of healthcare, you know, not just being a physician. Um, It's amazing. It is remarkable what we do and what we can provide, but it is rapidly changing. And it's just hard to say the future of medicine right now, you know, as far as um, what it's going to look like in the workplace. So I would say, look at all types, you know, because I think I don't think I was exposed to it. So that's Mm. why I just want to be kind of transparent. Like I think growing up, it was like nurses and doctors, right? But there's physical therapists and occupational therapists 
and um, physician assistant and nurse practitioner who all play like really important roles and um, they're important in different ways. So really think about what is your goal? How do you want to help people? What's what your interests are? and um, go from there, you know, look at all these different fields. Medicine in and of itself, it's just a long process. I mean, it, it's a four-year college with getting ready to um, apply to med school, you know, taking the, the exams and the applications and the interviews and all of that. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard to get into, very competitive. And then there's a residency after that. So residencies are anywhere from three years to seven years, um, depending on what you want to do. Wow. And it's all amazing. I think it's just truly, like you said, like it, it's, it's your calling. It's, um, you feel really like driven to do this. And someone said to me when I was thinking about it, you know, and I said, well, I think this is going to be really hard or something. They're like, well, everything's hard. You know, every career and every choice, everything is going to be hard to a certain extent. Right. And I, and I always tell my kids, like, if it's worth it, it's hard. <laughs> um, so it's not so much, I don't want to discourage anyone from doing something because it's hard. It's more just really going into it with open mind, open heart, and knowing what it's going to be. Um, I will say as a woman, and again, not to discourage anyone, I think there's in pediatrics in particular, I think there's more women than men in my med school class, it was 50, 50. So that's amazing. And I think more women should do it because they want to do it. But I also think that I wish again, someone had this conversation with me. My mom was a stay at home mom and that's what I knew. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I'm going to be working full time and having kids. Like, I don't want to do that. So, you know, something to think about is what do you want your life to look like in the future, right? Mm -hmm. I think we get kind of, you know, as young women, I can do this. I can go to med school. I'm, you know, I got this and, uh, you know, more power and equality and all that, which is fantastic, a (laughs) hundred percent like you go, but me personally, I wanted to be a mom. I wanted to be there for my kids. I wanted to see their recitals at school and, you know, all those things. So think about that and think about a career that maybe is a little bit more flexible or that you can do part-time or, you know, I just don't think we think about those things in our twenties. Yeah. And then you have kids and you're like, oh, well, (laughs) I kind of want to be home with them. You know, and, and I'm not saying good or bad, or, um, I know some parents or some mothers that are like, I'm much better when I work full time Mm -hmm. and I spend quality time with my kids in the evenings and weekends. Fantastic. Like good for you. It's not about being a better, worse mother. It's about what speaks to your heart. And for me personally, it took me going through med school and, and doing all that and thinking like, yeah, I could work four days a week, no big deal, to then having my own kids and being like, oh, I don't really want to miss all of that. So, and there is flexibility. I Listen, I was able to do it part-time. I was able to do, um, when I was a hospitalist, I worked overnights and, you know, I I slept a lot during the day, but still was around. Um, So there are different ways to do it. I'm not just trying to discourage people. It's just more to think about Um, because I don't, again, I don't think anyone really sat down and had that conversation with me. And I think that's fantastic. Again, those open conversations and just exploring all the possibilities so you can make an informed decision for yourself, but you are very right. You know, some of those ideas and some people just don't even know, like, uh, will I even want kids? Will I even want to, you know, how will that look down the future? And then as we all know, life twists and turns and, um, then we'll see. but having those conversations and just having those thoughts 
is really, really important in order to, you know, set yourself up. I started my career in uh, marine mammalogy, and now I am a family life and leadership coach. And I worked the first uh, like seven, eight years in the animal field and the last 12 or so in the human field. So yeah. you never know where, where you life is going to take you. You never know. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, let us know how we can connect with you and t- well, tell us a little bit about your parent coaching. Cause I know that, um, you were talking about a little bit about toddlers and things like that. So tell us a little yeah. bit about that and then where we can connect with you. So, um, yes. So parent coaching, um, as I was saying, I'm open to all ages. Um, even if your kids are grown, honestly, I think that this can help anyone, even with, you know, the whole reparenting ourselves and just figure out what we needed so that we can show up the way we want to. Um, I think it's going to help. So any age kids, I think will help. It's a 12 week program and we really go into the science and the research and it all makes so much sense. So I love that being, you know, a medical background and um, also available for just one-to-one coaching sessions so that if you're not ready to commit to 12 weeks, but just have some questions, that's another option. And then telemedicine is for anyone that lives in California um, at this time. So you can find me at askdrmom with a dash between doctorandmom.com. Um, I'm also a lot on Instagram for anyone that's on Instagram, also at ask Dr. Mom with a, um, with a dash at the end, uh, underscore at the end. And, um, yeah, those are the main ways. Um, my Instagram has ways to get to my YouTube channel and, um, and my blog. So that way you can kind of reach branch out from there and always reach out. If you have questions, I'm always happy to answer DMs or even do like videos based on questions. So love questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. We covered some big things today about telemedicine, about how to transition your daughters and your kids from pediatrician to um, adult doctors. And we also uh, really focused on how to help uh, our younger people. We always are going to need doctors. There's never going to be a time that we don't need doctors. Um, (laughs) Yes. And so thank you so much for being on here and sharing all of your ideas and your insight. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It was great. Absolutely. So you guys, we will be back next week with another episode of the 6570 Family Project Podcast. And remember, just keep teaching, keep laughing, keep loving, and above all, remember to keep showing up with intention in the 6570 or the 6,570 days that we have in their first uh, 18 years of this parenthood childhood experience, because they need you. So I will see you next week.